We left off here in section 5.2. We learned about disjoint, also known as mutually exclusive, and we learned how that affects the addition rule. Now the addition rule is going to help us be able to create a larger, more complicated probabilities than they were capable of in section 5.1. So for example, we are now going to toss two fair six-sided dice and note the sides that face up on both dice. All right, so start off with what's your sample size? Well, your first die has six options and your second die has six options, which means altogether you have six times six, which is 36 options. All right, now why would we not want to make a tree diagram of this? Well, with 36 branches, it'd be really hard to fit on a single page, right? It'd be so big that you'd be hard pressed to fit it all in there. All right, now we want to construct the sample space. We know it's six by six, which is 36. So we have six rows and six columns. Okay, so what we want to do here is we want to organize ourselves a little bit. For example, the first one would be one for the first die, one for the second die then one for the first die, two for the second die, then one for the first die, three for the second die, and so on. And we'll want to work our way out through all of that. And then we'll move on to two for the first die, two for the second die, and so on. With one for the second die. So if I was going to paste it, that's what it would look like. So there's two for the first, one for the second, two for the first, two for the second, two for the first, three for the second, and so on. And you can see by organizing it in this way, we have all 36 options possible. Now, what is the assumed probability for each outcome in that sample space? Well, that would be one out of 36 because the dice, or it is assumed that the dice are both fair and each toss is equally likely. And there we go. Next. So suppose instead of having it so that we just note the sides, but we actually want to sum the dice. So for example, rolling a one and a one wouldn't give you a sum of two. Rolling a one and two would give you a sum of three. Rolling a three and a three would give you a sum of six and so on. So let's find what the possibilities are and then their probabilities. So the possibilities are kind of obvious. The lowest you can roll is a two, that'd be one and one. The highest you could roll is a 12. Okay. Now what's the probability of two? Well, that would be one out of 36 because there's 36 options and only one of them is snake eyes, one and one this real quick. There we go. So this would be 1 out of 36. All right, what about summing to 3? Summing to 3 happens here at 2 and 1 or here at 1 and 2. That's it. There are no other numbers that add up to 3. So that would be 2 out of 36. And you can see how this is going to progress. The largest sum is going to happen at 7. 7 happens, and I'll highlight it for you. It's this cell, I'll highlight it in green, this cell, this one, right? Each of these is adding up to 7. This one, this one, and this one. So that gives you 6 out of 36. And then it starts working its way back down. 8 would be 5 out of 36, and so on. All right, so let me fill in those values one second. There they are. And of course, you wouldn't know all these values just by magic. You'd have to figure them out either by creating the sample space or by creating a tree diagram or just kind of logicking your way through the problem. But you'd have to be able to figure out the probabilities. Now, are these classical or are these empirical probabilities? Well, these are very much classical probabilities. We didn't roll the dice and figure this out. We just kind of set up a hypothetical sample space. So that would be classical for sure. All right, now find the probability that the dice add up to 7 or 11. That's an automatic win if ever you're playing craps. So 7 is right here, and 11 is down here, right there. So probability of 7 or 11 is those two green ones. 
So I want the probability of 7 plus the probability of 11, and that would be 6 out of 36 plus 2 out of 36, which makes 8 out of 36, or 0.2 repeating. All right, what about snake eyes? Snake eyes is an automatic loss if you're playing craps in a casino. So that would be this value right here, too. So I'm going to make it gray because we're sad. So what are the chances of that? Well, that would be um, probability of snake eyes would be equal to the probability of 1 comma 1, which is 1 out of 36, which is 0 0.027 repeating. There we go. So either way, either the fraction or the decimal. The decimal is more useful to us, honestly, but if you want to see the fraction, that's where it came from. All right, now we look back at the example that started our unit. Which is more likely, rolling box cars in a game of craps or drawing an ace? Okay, so let me, rolling snake eyes, let me label that. Snake eyes was gray, because that's sad. Let me rail, label box cars. I want to make box cars yellow. Actually, I'll make them brown. Or that's orange, excuse me. So orange is right here. Box cars is six and six. And I just Google imaged that so you could see. Box cars is six and six. See it? So right there, six, six. Okay. That's considered box cars. Because when you put them side by side it, to old time players, it looked like box cars. All right. So if that's the case, and that's box cars, six and six, that makes 12. The chances of that is 1 out of 36, what we just found up above. And the chances of an ace is 4 out of 52. We found that in the previous section. So that means that boxcars has a lower probability and an ace would have a higher probability. So our measurement, our unit of measurement, which is probability, tells us that the ace is more likely than rolling boxcars.